The Truth About Goblins Chapter 30 They stared at the map as Sephira held her white light overhead. Kit's finger was tracing the creek that cut across the page. Look, he said, pointing to a bend. We should be there by now. We would have been there ten minutes ago if we took that shortcut. But then we might have gotten lost, said Annie. Well, we're not much better off now, are we? he said. We're supposed to be at the cabin, but we're not, which means we don't know where we are, which means... We're not lost, said Sephira, bringing her light closer to the map. See, it's across the creek, so we have to find a way over it first. You sure about that? But she had already extinguished her light and was on her way to the creek. Annie shrugged and followed. They let the trickling of the water guide them, hoping that it wouldn't be too wide to cross. Fortunately for them, the creek was easy enough to jump. Without hesitating, the three continued. At first, they saw nothing through the branches. But a minute or so past the creek, Sephira pointed out a large, distant shadow. Not trees or anything else of the forest, but a building. It was hard to tell what it was, but they made for it anyway. You sure that's the cabin? said Kit. A loud bang. They jumped at the sound, listening as it echoed across the forest. What was that? whispered Annie. They didn't wait to hazard a guess. Although they weren't sure what the sound had been, they knew it had come from the cabin up ahead. Straight through the thick brush, the three of them ran towards the noise. Finally, they came within view of the cabin, the light of the moon grazing the patchwork of shingles that made up its rotting roof. No light was coming from inside. It's all dark, said Annie. Well, it is nighttime, said Sephira, though she sounded uneasy. Kit had the same feeling, but didn't bother mentioning it. Let's check it out, he paused. Quietly. They circled the cabin, none of them making a sound. Sephira had her light aglow, but kept it small so as not to attract attention. And after passing many boarded-up windows, they found the front door. They all stopped, staring at the handle. They must have been standing there for several minutes before Kit finally ran out of patience and grabbed it himself. Expecting resistance as he pushed, he nearly fell on his face as the door swung open effortlessly. Annie would have laughed, but the sight of the broken handle kept her silent. The door had been forced open. Sephira saw this too, quickly extinguishing her light. Keep quiet, she warned, stepping inside. Exchanging nervous glances, the other two followed. It was impossible to see anything in the dark. When all three were inside, they came to a halt. Annie tapped Sephira's shoulder. Oh, what do we... Quiet! She took slow steps into the room, listening. But there was nothing to be heard, nothing, aside from her own footsteps and shallow breathing. And then she stopped. Wait, she whispered. I stepped in something. What is it? said Annie. I don't know. She pulled her foot back. I need some light. She brought her hands before her and summoned her magic. In the faint glow, she looked down to her shoe. The light went out. Sephira? Annie caught her as she staggered backwards. Sephira, what happened? She couldn't manage words. Impatient, Kit pushed past the two. Give me a sec, I'll bring out my fireball. Sephira tried to stop him. Kit, no! The cabin was bathed in light. They saw the single bed, empty. They saw the stove and the armoire. 
They saw the blood and then the body. They were gone, out the cabin, across the creek, into the forest. All three were terrified, not of the corpse in the cabin, but of the killer, the murderer. Without thought to direction, they sprinted as fast as they could, whichever way they turned. Kit took the lead, trusting his instincts. But his step faltered, he tripped over a stray root and into a ditch. He tried to warn the others, but they were already on top of him. Ouch, he said, pushing Annie off his legs. Get off! Shh, shh, hissed Safira. I heard something. They crouched in the ditch, silent, holding their breath as they listened. Their own hearts sounded like drums in their ears. Each faint rustling could have been thunder. Someone was walking. They could hear him coming closer as a twig snapped beneath his feet. The killer was above their heads. He knew they were hiding there. He had to. He must have heard them by now. His boots scraped against the dirt. He was going to find them. There was another sound, more footsteps. He was turning away, he was leaving. And in a matter of moments, the forest was silent. The killer had vanished back into the night. The three said nothing, waiting as the seconds turned to minutes. Kit got to his feet, restless in the lengthening silence. Safira grabbed his arm as he started climbing out of the ditch, but he took her hand in his and gently pushed it away, pulling himself on to higher ground. The other two stayed where they were. He's gone, they heard him sigh in relief. You can come out now. Annie was the first to rise, peering over the edge of the ditch. She could see the back of Kit's shoes as he looked out into the forest. That was close, she whispered, her voice still shaking. Way too close. I think we should. A light, blinding. She heard him scream. Run! Run! She bolted in the opposite direction, diving into the thicket. Safira was close behind her, but she couldn't hear Kit. She kept running. It was familiar to her, the terror. It was the fear she had experienced down in the mines, in the darkness of the tunnels. She hit a tree. No, a man. She threw her fists, but he had her by the arms and wasn't letting go. Screaming, she kicked. Annie! Annie! The voice was familiar. Relax, Annie! It's me! It's Timothy! She felt him pull back as she stopped attacking. Timothy? Timothy! Sephira came stumbling after her. Oh, Timothy, he got Kit! Who got Kit? He looked from face to face in alarm. Where is he? Kit stumbled through the bushes. I'm here, he gasped. I'm okay. He came to a stop behind Safira. Jeepers, Timmy, is that you? What's going on here? said Timothy. What's gotten into all of you? I'm sorry, exclaimed Annie. But the cabin! Oh, Timothy, the cabin! wailed Safira. Hold on now, let's take it easy for a bit. He looked from each of their faces and tried piecing things together. Is everyone all right? A moment, and they turned to Kit. His face was blank. He didn't say a word. Instead, he brought his hand out in front of him. They watched, silent, as the moonlight fell over his palm. His knuckles were white, his fingers wrapped around an object that caught the light and glinted. His glasses. Kit looked to Timothy, dazed. I got his glasses. Hey, hi. I'm your narrator, Miranda Eastwood. 
also the author of The Truth About Goblins. If you liked this chapter, remember to add, follow, or subscribe to this channel so you can hear the next one. And if you didn't like this chapter, <laughs> oh well, I can't really do anything about that. In any case, I just thought I'd let you know about my Patreon. You can check it out if you'd like to throw some support my way. It would mean a lot to me. Not to mention there's loads of extra exclusive content that I only post on Patreon. While I'm at it, I'll mention that The Truth About Goblins is now available as a complete audiobook, and you can get it wherever you get your audiobooks. Thanks for listening! <laughs>